أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Today I'm going to talk about something that I feel very very strongly about and that is uh, an issue that I think many of us struggle with at different levels and, and that is that I believe that many of us on different levels uh, live inside of what I call a mental prison. Uh, and, and there are different degrees of extreme when it comes to our mental prison. I'll explain what I mean and then I'll talk about some of the, the, the poisonous habits that we have that actually keep us in our own mental prisons. What I mean by mental prison is that Many of us live lives which are comfortable. For, for example, we may live free, but internally we are, we, we are shackled. And many times these shackles are mental and psychological and emotional. And what happens is these shackles are strengthened or rather we, we actually sometimes create some of these shackles through habits that we've built over our lifetime sometimes, and we don't realize what we're doing. They're habits that we've gotten so used to, but what these habits do is they become self-sabotaging. We are actually um, keeping ourselves shackled mentally and psychologically through these habits. So what I wanna do is just go through a few of these habits, a few of these very toxic behaviors, mental behaviors that we have, that keep us inside of our own mental prison. The first one I wanna talk about has to do with focus. So oftentimes we believe, so I'm gonna talk about some myths and then I'm gonna leave you with a few um, statements. And I want you to take those statements, you know, preferably write them down, and then I want you to reflect on them. So oftentimes what we believe is that we are a product of what happens to us, that our lives are um, simply a reaction to the events that happen in our lives. So something will happen and we believe that um, we just react to that or that we actually become victims of our own lives, victims to the things that happen to us in our lives. This is actually a myth because only a very small portion of where we are has to do with what happened to us. The majority of it is how we reacted or how we responded to what happened to us. So there are three things in any given moment that determines our, what, where we end up being, where we end up going. There are three things in, every, in any given moment, anytime something happens, anytime we experience uh, a challenge or we experience anything in life, there are three things that determine where we end up. The first is what we choose to focus on in that given moment. What we choose to focus on in that situation or in that experience. So for example, in any given moment, there will always be challenges and there will always be blessings and they always come at the same time. This is one of the truths of Allah. I mean, this is one of the realities of this, of this life. In fact, this is one of the realities of dunya, is that never is anything all bad and never is anything all good. That's just the way dunya is. Dunya is a combination of good and bad. Does everybody agree? I think most people agree that dunya is ups and downs, right? Yes? Okay. Someone, I'm going to actually sort of um, present a better analogy, what I think is a better analogy. And I read this somewhere. So we often believe that dunya, that our life is peaks and valleys, right? We go, sometimes we're high, sometimes we're low. And we go through life in these peaks and valleys. So what this writer said is, he gave a different analogy. He said, life is actually like a railroad track where on one side, you know a railroad track, you have two sides and they're parallel and they're always next to each other, right? That on one side you have the good things in your life, the, the ease, the blessings. And on the other side you have the challenges and they're always right next to each other. See, the problem with the narrative of peaks and valleys, of, of highs and lows, is, it, is that many people start to think 
that we have all good or all bad, right? If I ask you about the best time in your life, the time when you were the happiest, and you go and you reflect about that time, was it perfect? Was there absolutely no challenges? Was nothing wrong? Did it become momentary Jannah? What's the answer? No, right? There was challenges at the same time. Similarly, and this is the thing we often forget, is that if I were to ask you about the hardest time in your life, about the biggest challenge that you faced in your life, I'm sure everyone can bring it up like that, right? We tend to think about this a lot. If, if you bring to mind the hardest time in your life, and then I ask you, during that time, you were going through all these challenges, right? Was there anything good in your life at that time? Was there any blessings? Were there any, was there any ease? And if you go back and reflect, you'll find that yes, in fact, there was. And there wasn't just one. It was plural, it was many. So the reality of dunya is that at every given moment, there is both good and bad. At every given moment, there is both yusr, ease, and if you're having usr, which is difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what? Inna ma'al usri yusra. So at the same time that you're going through this difficult time, you're going through this challenge, you also have ease at the same time. Now this is where focus comes in. What do you choose to focus on in any given moment? Because there's both. We, we've, we've decided as a group, yes? I should have talked about, about body language, but that's okay. Yes, okay. We decided as a group that life is like a railroad track, right? You have them both parallel. And so if you are in a situation where you're faced with a challenge, you're faced with a difficulty, you're faced with a hardship, at that same time, you're also being given ease and blessings. And so your, cho your choice is, which side of the railroad track am I going to focus on? And along with that point is another uh, statement that I want you to take home with you. So these are like, I'm going to leave you with many statements that are going to be take home messages for you to reflect on and hopefully remember. The next one is that what you focus on grows. So the things that you do choose to focus on will actually become more prominent in your life. And they will become more prominent in your mind. What does that translate to? Here's what it translates to. People who focus on problems will always see problems. People who focus on problems will always see problems. So what happens is, okay, you're a problem solver, right? A problem solver naturally focuses on problems. That's the double-edged sword. And so what happens is you'll focus on a problem and it's all you see. But once that problem has been resolved, what happens next? You find a new problem to focus on and it's all you see. So I don't need to tell you what happens in your life. You're always focused on a problem and it's all you see. And this isn't because your life is all problems. It's because that's what you chose to focus on. And what you focus on grows. And realize that that's a choice you have. That's a mental decision that you're making. Because Allah has given you both. You can't blame Allah. See, we focus on problems. They become so big. They surround us. And then we blame Allah. But Allah gave you both. Allah gave you, yes, you have a challenge. But you have a lot of blessings at the same time, but you're not focusing on them. You don't even see them. And so they become like nothing to you. And instead you're surrounded, and then you become paralyzed by your problems. And that is why? Because you took that one problem, you hyper-focused on it, and it grew. And it became all you see. And therefore it surrounds you, and then you become paralyzed by it. Now, focus, that's the first part. I said the three things in any given situation that determine where you end up. The first was focus. The second is what meaning do you assign to what you just experienced? What meaning do you assign to what you're facing? Does everyone understand what I mean? 
So something is happening to you, or you just found out some news. You've just experienced something. Now, you have to assign a meaning to that. Here is the thing about meaning. Here's the thing about meaning. Two people could have the exact same experience and assign a completely different meaning to it. Let me give you just a very simple example, okay? Um, shots at the doctor. So you go to the doctor to get a shot. Now when you take an infant to go to the doctor to get a shot, how does the infant react to that? The infant is extremely angry, screams and shouts, and basically hates the doctor, right? To the infant, you have just caused him or her nothing but pain. That's the meaning that this infant assigns to this experience because the infant can't understand beyond the, the needle. The infant can't understand beyond the pain, am I right? But when you take an adult to get a shot and now the adult knows that this shot is actually curing him or her, it's, it's what's saving his or her life. So this person would otherwise die without this medicine. So it's the same exact experience, it's a shot. But look at the difference in meaning that you've assigned between the infant and the adult. So now my question to you is, because now that they have different meanings assigned, how different is their response? To the exact same, what, experience, to the exact same life event, but their, their meaning that they've assigned is different and therefore the response is different. The infant is, is very angry. And some of us respond in this exact way to our lives. Why me? How could you do this to me? How could this happen to me? Sometimes we direct that anger at Allah. Sometimes we direct that anger at other people. Sometimes we direct that anger at ourselves. But do you guys know what I'm saying? And sometimes we become very bitter. That's like that infant who's very bitter about this shot. But it has to do with the meaning that was assigned to what just happened. And here's the thing. The adult had a different meaning assigned to the very same experience. And that is, this shot is actually saving my life. And so the response of the doctor isn't bitterness or anger or resentment. It's actually gratitude. Very different. And it all goes back to how you see, how you understand the things. What lens do you have in, in seeing your life and understanding your life? And this is the meaning that we assign. Now, how can we start to change our lens of how we see our lives? This is where we have to go back and look at what is the Islamic lens? What is it that Allah and his messenger teach us to use as a lens? I'm going to give you guys a few answers to that question. The Prophet ﷺ said in a Sahih Hadith, The matter of a believer is strange. Everything is good for him or her. The matter of a believer is strange. Everything is good for them. And this is only the case for a believer, by the way, the Prophet ﷺ explains. And he says that if there's something that the believer gets that he or she wants, then the believer responds with gratitude, and so it is good for them. And if the believer gets something that they don't want, he or she responds with patience, and so it is good for them. What does this mean? This means that the lens that a believer should be wearing in understanding their life and seeing their life is that it's all good. Is that it's actually all good. Now that might sound too um, rose-colored, but it isn't. Because it doesn't mean that you'll, a believer will never feel pain. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean a believer will never face hardship or that a believer will never have to struggle or that a believer will never have to lose things that they love. No. On the contrary, we know that the, those prophets who were closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were tested the most. But what it means is that despite that pain and despite that challenge and despite that struggle, in the end, it's actually good for them. Just like that shot. 
Remember we said that 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 adult was getting a shot, but it was saving his life. It was actually curing him. And that's how a believer has to view his or her life, is that even the challenges are here to make me stronger. They're here to teach me something. They're actually here to make me better. When you change the way you understand your life, you change the way you respond to your life. And you completely transform. And it all has to do with what you choose to focus on, what meaning you assign. And now once you assign that meaning, then the third, the third thing that dis determines where you end up is what you're going to do about it. Now it's action. Because our lives are about, you know, the psychological, the mental, but also the action. It's internal, but it's also external. And so once you determine what you're going to focus on, once you assign meaning to it, then you have to decide what you're going to do. What action are you going to take? And these three things are what actually determine where you end up. It's not what happens to you. It's what you do with it. Does that make sense? It's not what happens to you. It's what you do with it. So I'm going to give you a couple more um, like statements of wisdom that I want you to take home and reflect on. Here's another one. A person doesn't drown by falling into the ocean. A person drowns by staying there. Make sense? So you don't drown just by falling in the, into, the, into the sea. You don't drown. But you'll drown if you choose to stay there. And then this is, brings me to the next toxic mistake that we make that keep us imprisoned. And that is that we get stuck. We get stuck. And when I say we get stuck, we get stuck mentally, we get stuck emotionally, and we get stuck physically. In, in negative situations. So one of the ways we do this is in our focus. I mentioned earlier about focusing on problems. Another toxic mistake that we make that keeps us stuck is that we tend to focus on our past. And what happens, and, and, and psychologists explain why this happens. One of the reasons why people focus on their past, and unfortunately, we don't just focus on our past, but we focus on the most negative part of our past. We replay these things. We fixate on these things. And one of the reasons why we do that is it's sort of like a protective measure that we think that I have to remember this and I have to keep replaying it so that it doesn't happen again. So we're thinking that this is going to protect us. But it actually becomes self-defeating. Because you're sticking, you're actually um, creating, you may actually be creating patterns where these things repeat. So, so being fixated on a negative part of your past isn't going to protect you. It actually can have the, the counter effect. So what we have to do is we have to learn from the things that happened to us in our past. But we cannot get fixated on that. We... We have to have the mental discipline to be able to think about moving forward rather than being stuck in the past. And now this brings me to the next words of wisdom. And um, this was something I read, and I just, I thought it just, it's something that if we live by this, we wouldn't fall into this trap. And that is that remember that the past is a place of reference, not a place of residence that it's a place of reference, not a place of residence. Now to make this stick, I'm gonna give you an analogy. When you're driving on the highway, where do you have to look? In front, good, okay. What would happen if you, instead of looking in front, you fixated on what was behind you? You'd crash, simple. So. In our, you know, when we're driving in a car, we have a reference to what's behind us, right? It's called that little mirror. It's called the rear view mirror, right? How big is it? It's like this big. Even if you get the really big one, it's like this big. 
Yeah? How big is the window that shows us what's in front of us? It's this big. Why? Because our focus is supposed to be moving forward. It's not supposed to be what's behind. However, we should reference what's behind, right, just to have an idea of where we're going. But if someone stops looking forward and just looks at the rear view mirror, they'll crash. And that's the analogy I want to stick so that you, under, you remember this point, okay? Now, in terms of you know, kind of bringing it all together, how can we get out of these toxic habits? What can we do practically? So I've given you guys concepts, but what can we do practically? One of the tools I'm gonna give you, and, and of course there are many tools, but I'm just gonna give you a couple tools um, of how we can do that in our limited time. One of them is the daily practice of gratitude. Now this is something that so much research has shown to be so effective that it can even cure symptoms of depression and anxiety. It can alleviate symptoms of depression and anxiety just simply by keeping a gratitude journal. And this means writing three to five things every day that you're grateful for. Why do you think that's so powerful? The reason it's so powerful is simply because you're shifting your focus, aren't you? Remember we said at the beginning that life is that railroad track. But we tend to be sort of in the habit, and again, some of it is these self-sabotaging protective measures. We focus on the negative, and we think that's going to protect us, right? But by shifting your focus through the practice of gratitude, you're focusing now on the yus, right? The ease in your life, the blessings in your life. So what happens to them, anyone? What happens when you focus on something, what does it do? What you focus on grows. And so what happens when you focus on the positive things in your life, the ease in your life, the blessings in your life, what happens is they grow. Their significance in your life grows. All of a sudden, instead of feeling stressed and poor, right? Because when you focus on, on scarcity, you feel poor. When you focus on what's missing, this is, the, this is the thing. When you focus on what's missing, you feel poor. You feel impoverished. But when you focus on what you have, you feel rich. You feel full. And that has to do with focus. Because nobody's life is perfect. And everyone has both ease and hardship. Everyone. No matter how rich they are, they have both ease and hardship. And no matter how tested they are, Allah also gives them ease but you choose what to focus on. So by focusing on what you have, this practice of gratitude, it grows. And that's why you actually change your state. And here's the other thing that happens, is that when you choose to focus on gratitude, you'll find more and more reasons to be grateful. Because you've, you've it's, it's actually something neurological, you're going to start to notice the things that, you're, that, that there are to be grateful for. But it works the other way too. When you focus on negative things, problems, what's missing, you'll also start to notice more and more things to be worried about. You'll start to notice more and more problems, more and more things that are missing. So you actually attend to those things that you're in the habit of attending to. Does that make sense? You'll start, to, you'll start to actually notice more of those things in your life that you're used to noticing, whether they're positive or they're negative. And so you have to train your brain through, this is one of the ways, through the practice of gratitude, to, to train your brain to not just be grateful, but to then start to notice more things to be grateful for. And that's what actually happens when you practice gratitude. And of course, this is an Islamic principle. Allah says that if you're grateful, I'll increase you. This is, a, this is a divine principle. And then finally, I'll leave you with this. The practice of dhikr, the practice of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is one of these things that fills, fills your mind and your heart and your soul 
with positive light. And then what happens is you attract positive light. So you have to actually clean your heart and fill your heart with what's positive and then you will, as I said, you will start to notice more of that and you'll actually start to attract more of that. You know, people, um, people sense other people's energy, right? People sense what other, you know, what other people are. If someone is, a very, is very negative, other people are also repelled from them. You know when you're in a really bad mood? Do you notice that people like to be around you? Not so much, right? So this is actually, we, we attract what we have internally. Does that make sense? So one of the most powerful ways to be internally healthy and to have light internally is through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something we have to do daily. Okay, I'm going to leave you guys with my dhikr challenge. This is just three-part prescription of how, of what habits we have to have every single day in terms of our dhikr. And when I say mine, it's not mine. This is the prescription given to us by Allah and His Messenger. I just called it dhikr challenge. The first is our salah. And that's that our salah, our five daily fard prayers, are like oxygen. The prayer to the heart is like oxygen to the body. We can't live without that. And there's no way we can be mentally or spiritually or psychologically healthy if we don't have spiritual oxygen. It's really as simple as that. So the salah. And, and it needs to be on time because when a doctor gives a prescription, he or she knows what he or she is doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a prescribed time for fajr. And it's because he knows what he's doing. You know if the doctor were to give you medicine and it were keeping you alive, you wouldn't mess with the timing, right? If the doctor said you have to take it, once in the morning, once at noon, once at 2 o'clock, once at 5 o'clock, once at 8 o'clock. You're not going to mess with it. You're not going to skip three doses. You're not going to, you know, take five doses before you sleep. Right? That's overdosing, and it's not going to work. You have to take it and take it on time. Why? Because you trust the doctor. Now, we have to remember who has prescribed the salah and who has prescribed the timing for the salah. It's not a doctor. It's the creator of the doctor in the heavens and the earth. You feel me? So putting that into perspective and realizing that Allah knows what he's doing. The second is the adhkar. The adhkar are the supplications, the duas that the Prophet Wasallam used to say throughout his day. These adhkar are life-changing and life-saving. And if you don't, and don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. Just do it. And you will see for yourself. The adhkar are, and now there's like technology to help us. Everyone has their phone on them. There are apps that you can download that give you a list of all the adhkar in different acts of life, right? The mundane. There's a dua for everything. You're leaving your house, you're eating, you're starting to drive, you're traveling, you got new clothes, you're afraid, you're anxious. Even before intimacy, there's a dua. There's a dua for everything. So, so incorporating these du'as into your life is one of the most transformative things that we can do. Now there's a lot of them, but there are certain ones that you sort of can't live without and you have to have part of your daily routine. The first is the morning supplications. And this one's after Fajr or as early as you can in the morning. The second are the evening supplications. And that's after Asr or before Maghrib. And the third is the ones before you sleep. Now there is an app um, called My Dua. This is usually the one I recommend, M-Y-D-U-A-A. -A. It's Fortress of a Muslim in an app. And this one, and there's many, but this one um, is one of those that, that I use and, and, and is very, it's really, it, it helps you to be consistent because you have your phone on you. Lastly, let me just tell you this. One of the traps of shaitan, and this is gonna happen to you because it happens, it's like one of his most, favorite traps and that is he likes to tell us that it's all or none right you know how you're like really good with your prayers or you're really good with your adhkar or you're, you're doing really well and then maybe you slip a little bit so what's he going to do when you slip a little bit he's going to come and say you know what you should just give up completely you get it all or none 
This is a shaitani trap. Allah is not all or none. Allah will reward us for the smallest deeds. Allah does not expect us to be perfect. So even if you can't do all of the morning supplications, just do some. But the most effective thing you can do is be consistent. And this is also a divine principle that Allah loves the actions that are small. Sorry, Allah loves the actions that are consistent, even if they're small. So consistency is key. And it's not hard to understand this because anyone who's ever worked out knows what I'm talking about, right? You can't say, well, I did 500 sit-ups once and then I didn't do any more and it didn't work. <laughs> you have to be consistent, even if you do only 50 sit-ups, but you do them consistently. Lastly, the Qur'an is being connected to the Qur'an daily, understanding it and trying to apply it. أَخُولِي قَوْلِي هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ إِنَّا غَفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدَكَ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنْتَ أَسْتَغْفِرُكُ وَأَتُوبُ لَيْكَ um, As Buna mentioned, I have, um, I'm going to have my books available, inshallah, just outside at the Al-Maghrib booth. I have two books. Um, the first one is Reclaim Your Heart. And Reclaim Your Heart is a collection of work I did over like a decade. Um, I basically wrote this book with blood, sweat, and tears um, from the things that I learned in my own life uh, and, and things that I tried to write so that to help others. And it's about how to get through this life without allowing this life to own us um, and to own our hearts. It's kind of, a, it's sort of like a, a manual, if, if you will, of how to handle the things that happen um, you know, how spiritual tools to handle the love, loss, pain, um, and happiness that, that we face in this life. And then I have a new book called Love and Happiness, which is also a collection of shorter quotes, insights. It's kind of um, like a coffee table book. It's, it's colored, has photos. Um, um, and I'll have, inshallah, both of them available. The second book um, is also a, a kind of about my journey, but uh, a, a little bit about how I realized that you know, despite the challenges that we have in our life, there's also, mashallah, Allah gives us many blessings and, 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 and there's a lot of light and beauty as well. Uh, and it really has to do with how do we handle and what do we choose to focus on. Um, but inshallah, that's going to be available outside at the Al-Maghrib booth and um, I'll be doing some signing if people are interested. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.